So we're here at the World Creators Summit and I'm here with uh, Robert Levine uh, and uh, we're going to chat about his uh, book uh, Free Ride, How the Internet is Destroying the Culture Business and How the Culture Business Can Fight Back. Uh, so uh, it's great to have you on and uh, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Great. Thank you very much. Great. So I wanted to ask you first of all, uh, uh, what is your background prior to writing the book? Like uh, what have you been involved in? Well, I did a bunch of stuff. I started my career in journalism as a music critic. I worked for Spin for a while for the Rolling Stone website long ago yeah. when the website was not such a major part of the overall business. Yeah. And then I did some general stuff. I was a freelance writer for a long time and I was the editor, the executive editor of Billboard for a bit. And then I decided to write the book. Awesome. And so when you did you take the leap and decided to start writing uh, Free Ride. Did you have a collection of articles that you, you started thinking, oh, maybe they, they make sense together, or did you just start from scratch and you wanted to, to do this as a, as, a, as, a, as a whole book? Well, I was trying to think what could be harder than editing a music trade magazine when the music business and the magazine business are falling apart. And this is the only thing I could think of that was more difficult and paid worse. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> you know, I had been following this for a long time, sort of off and on, and I thought, I used to feel very differently. You know, I thought that Napster would really, Napster and the changes it represented would really make the music business and eventually the media business much more fair to creators. Um, eventually, I saw that that wasn't happening. I started, I started to question it as I think, I, I don't think what I believed was stupid. It turned out to be wrong. It seemed pretty reasonable at the time. I questioned it as I think a lot of people have I think some of this sort of coalesced, hey, what happened to the future we were promised? It's not quite adding up to that. Yeah. It was supposed to be, you have more access to markets as a creator. Instead, there's really no market. And the other thing that happened was, you know, people say, oh, the music business messed all this stuff up. Certainly, the music business made, ma made a lot of bad decisions. I'm, there's plenty of blame to go around. But if you look at the newspaper business, the TV business, the movie business, the book business, photography, none of them did much better. So all of a sudden, it was a question of, hey, wait a minute. People say the music business, they protected too much. They insisted on price too much. But look at the newspaper business. They gave everything away, and they're doing even worse. Maybe there's a deeper problem that deserves examination. And that's, how, that, that's where it came from. Absolutely, and, and uh, so in the book you say that the, the real conflict online is between the media companies that found much of the that uh, found much of the entertainment we read, uh, see, and hear, and technology companies that want to distribute their content. So here at the Creator Summit, I'm coming to understand that while each of these parties has its own interests to protect, there seems to be we seem to be past uh, the all-out conflict that maybe we had uh, like two or three years ago. Uh, do you think that's the case? Do you think maybe uh, the tones are too mild now? I think this is something, <clears throat> you know, when people talk about the sort of quote-unquote copyright war, it's usually people on the other side, and they talk about the media business versus the people. One of the things that I tried to show in the book is that that's an artificial construction. I don't, you know, the people want great content. You know, the people in the U.S., more of the people buy cable TV than high-speed internet connections. I'm not defending that choice, it wouldn't be mine, but that's what the people, the people vote with their wallets and that's what they vote for. What I see is a conflict between two sets of companies. One wants to sell high and the other one wants to buy low. It's like any price negotiation, except in this case, because you're dealing with non-physical goods, the conflict takes place largely in the legal sphere, whether that's in courts or in legislatures and lobbying, whatever. So you're gonna have periods of disagreement. Some of them are going to be sublimated. Some of them are going to be ugly. And I think that's going to go back and forth. But what we're really looking at is a very contentious, often very pretentious price negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't like to go you know, delve back into the past, but uh, I think it's an episode that you mentioned in the book that is quite interesting. So, uh, talking about the moment where Lars Ulrich, or Ulrich uh, stepped out of the car uh, in front of the Napster offices, and in that moment, the industry realized how much of a backlash they could have from reacting to what was happening in the technology world in a, in a certain way, and uh, uh, with, I guess, an act that maybe was not the best suited to, to, to take that stance. But, uh, um, you know, this uh, also was also highlighted by Chris Ruin, the author of Freeloading, in a panel yesterday. And he was talking about the chilling effect that this had over artists and artists kind of not really speaking about any of those issues for a long time after that. 
for fear of, of, of problems or backlash from their fans or anything like that. So do you feel, feel like we're past that phase now and artists are starting to feel more comfortable about speaking about rights issues and, and the fact that they need to make money out of their creations? Well, the, look, with the Napster thing, you know, it's very complicated because I think that what, what Ulrich said, if you listen to what he said, it was pretty reasonable. Yeah, sure. Metallica had always let fans tape concerts and they always let them trade tapes for non-commercial purposes. They only sued Napster when, when a song was on there that they hadn't finished yet. If you listen to what Ulrich said, he was not unreasonable. The problem was in the way it was presented. You know, if you drive up in a chauffeured SUV to a startup company founded by a college student, the optics, as we would say in the U.S., are terrible. And you still sort of see that. You know, whatever you think about the RIAA um, suing individual downloaders, I'm not sure it was the terrible miscarriage of justice that some people saw it as, but I did think it was a bad idea, not only in terms of the court system, but in terms of how to resolve the problem. A, a lot of people had very reasonable views and set them back a long way by reacting in unproductive ways. Um, Partly as a result of that, maybe people interpreted it rightly, maybe wrongly. A lot of artists were reluctant to speak out. Now you see more artists speaking out. And what's good about that, and I think it's very important, is you have artists saying a lot of different things. Some people say, you know, like David Lowry is one example, this is really unacceptable. I'm sticking up for my rights very aggressively. If I suffer from that a bit, I'm fine with that. You have other people saying, hey, you know, this is the future. We have to adjust. We have to make money in different ways. But, hey, I'm really uncomfortable with what I see as being ripped off by big companies. You know, people say, do you think people should fight piracy or adapt? And I always say the same thing, which is yes. You know, I'm in the new world. I want to promote my book in new ways and sell it online and do as many interesting things as I can. I don't see that as incompatible with sticking up for my rights. I want to do both at once. I think a lot of artists should do both at once. You have some artists that say, I'm comfortable with downloading. I want to give away my music. Yeah. I have no problem with that. If it's your choice, you should be able to do it. I, I always say I want everyone to be able to publish a book. I just don't want everyone to be able to publish my book. And, and if you're an artist, if you think giving away your music for free helps you, you should do that. And you should speak up about it. I have no problem with that. I, I'm not sure that it, it's... I, I question whether that's actually right, but good for them for speaking up. And, and I think that's important. And it, it, those artists' voices have really been missing. And it's good to have them all, even though it's very chaotic, it's, it's a very healthy debate to be having. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you have a particular stance about Creative Commons. Can you, can you explain what, what you, how, how you feel about Creative Commons? Just to be clear, I have a particular stance about the Creative Commons organization as opposed to the concept. Okay, yeah. You know, if you think about how Creative Commons is portrayed, it's portrayed as, you know, it's a legal licensing mechanism that you can use to share your content with the world without the restrictions that copyright puts on it under most licensing regimes. That's a great thing. It's hard to be against that. As I said, you should have the work, to, you should have the right to charge for your work, make it available under certain circumstances, or make it available freely. To the extent that Creative Commons helps creators do that, it's a fantastic thing. The devil is in the details. If you look at some of the licenses, there are some things in there that are pretty unfavorable to artists. If you look at the organization, the board of directors and the way it's run suggests that it's not run for the benefit of artists. There's The last time I looked, and this might be out of date, there was one professional creator out of 15 board members. There's a lot of people who are close to Google. They get a lot of money from Google. The vice chair of the organization is Sergey Brin's mother-in-law. When Creative Commons, I'm sorry to go on, but I want to be clear. When Creative Commons was a small organization in San Francisco, I think this made a lot of sense. It was a group of people had an idea. They wanted to share it with the world. That's how you get something started. I have no problem with that. You move on a couple years, Creative Commons is now a major multinational NGO. It operates worldwide. They do a lot of interesting things with governments. At this point, when you reach that size, you have to have a board of directors that befits a multinational NGO. You have to have the kind of governance that professional organizations have. Sergey Brin's mother-in-law as vice chair is laughable. 
this is appropriate for a local organization in San Francisco. This is the way the B'nai B'rith runs. This is the way the Lions Club runs. This is not the way a major NGO runs. They need artists on the board. The idea, the way they started and what they tried to do, I have no issue with. The idea that they're now a major organization and it's run in such a weird way by a group of people who all seem to know each other, this is really a bad idea. And that's got to change. Yeah, yeah sure. And uh, you know, you're talking in the book about um, the fact that consumers are, you know, the model on which uh, content providers operate is going back to, I guess, the age-old, uh, you call it, you know, way of uh, selling something for more than what you paid for for it. And, and, uh, and so, you know, actually selling stuff, whether it's a subscription or whether it's, a, it's an MP3 or a book, uh, to consumers instead of uh, expecting advertising to foot the bill for, for what you're giving away. Uh, and so uh, how do you feel that progressing? And do you feel like there is some wiggle room and some experimentation that can be made uh, in regards to price points, for example? Because we know that a lot of people are not going to spend $10 a month uh, for, for music. Well, let me go back. You know, one of, the, I have a, one of my good friends from childhood works on Wall Street, and he's a famous, or he did for a while, is a, fa- a saying that was influenced on me, which is, there's only one way to make money in business. Sell something for more than it costs you. That's the only business there is to be in. In some cases, that's selling a thing for more than the thing costs you. In some cases, it's selling advertising. People, a lot of people ask me how I feel about free media, and I think the, the idea between free and paid is a bit of a distraction, because if you think about broadcast TV, the TV was free, but that's not what they were selling. They were selling an audience to advertisers. That also works. I think it might not work as well anymore because now that there's so much advertising space that can be generated at little cost, the business advertising rates are going to go way down. So selling things might be better. But I have no problem with any business model that relies on, you know, investing in what you're selling ads against. That that's legal and and ethical. Um, so I think that's less of an issue, although I think advertising isn't going to be as good as people think. As far as price points, I think it's important to experiment. And as a, the best way to do that is to keep that power for, the, for yourself. If you think about iTunes, when iTunes sold everything for 99 cents, I'm sorry, I'm using U.S. pricing because that's what's in my head. It did pretty well. Then iTunes got, then the labels won pricing flexibility as like a deal point. So you started to see some songs for 79 or 69 cents, some songs for $1.29. And there are all these stories on blogs. Look, iTunes raised their prices and sales went down. Hey, wait a minute. Sales went down, I think, by 13%. And a lot of the most popular songs, which means like a lot of the transactions, not a lot of the titles, were 29% more expensive. Well, you know, if you're making, let's say, 20% more money, because some of those songs were down price, if you're making 20% more money, selling 13% less stuff, you're making more money. The goal of the media, the media business has always been obsessed with bestsellers, the charts. That reflects a world in which things were priced on a relatively consistent basis. How many albums am I selling? Well, they're all about 15 bucks. So the person who sold the most is probably making the most money. So let's just use this as shorthand. But hey, you know, the object of business is not to sell as much stuff as you can. It's to make as much money as you can. There might be other considerations. You might want to give away something at a loss to be in another business. Give away the razor, sell the blade. You might want to give away music to sell concert tickets. But at the end of the day, you're always going to have to sell something. So what I think creators need is less of X price point than an amount of control that lets them take their destiny and experiment with the business models that work for them and not be experimented on to find a business model that works for someone else. And let me just say, you know, people ask me, why am I selling my book for a certain price? What price should a book be worth? Sorry to use myself as an example, but it's just easy to not pick on anyone else. You know, I wrote a book about the media business that deals a lot with copyright law. There's a limited audience for it. If I wrote a book about hot, sexy teen vampires, and, and I'm working on it now because, you know, times are tough. Um, that's actually not a joke. Um, no, it's a joke that I'm working on it, not that times are tough. You know, I might price it at $2 because 
one thing we've learned is an enormous number of people are interested in hot and sexy teen vampires. So you have a gigantic reachable audience. Let's get that book into the hands of as many people as possible. You have this huge audience of potential fans. Let's get it to as many people as we can. A book like mine, there are fewer potential fans. The vast majority of people in the world don't care at all about the issues I'm writing about, or they want something that's more simplistic and less dense. I don't hold it against them. I, I didn't. I have no illusion. I didn't expect to end up on the bestseller list, and my expectations in that regard were fulfilled. <laughs> it's fine. You're talking about somebody who's doing niche, niche right? As well. So. Okay. So, like, you know, if I sold my book for two dollars to try to get it to as many people as possible, it would have been pretty stupid because I'm going to run out of potentially interested people. It was Random House's decision in my case, not mine. But I would have made the same decision they did. As a matter of fact, hey, you know, when I talk to people who read my book, I get a lot of emails from intellectual property attorneys. And I'm thinking, hey, wait a minute. They actually make a fair bit of cash. Maybe my digital book should have been more expensive. Or ideally, maybe it should have started out high. The day the digital book comes out, it's $25. And then it sinks to $25. And then it sinks to $15. Would this work? I don't know. But what I want is the ability to experiment rather than giving all that power and the data that comes with it to Amazon. Yep. I want to do what works for me, what works for my publisher, not what works for another company. However much I respect that company, they do a great job. Their interests are not mine. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess uh, part of it is also the fact that the industry is has not, uh, you know, we're seeing, we're starting to see now uh, some real progress has been made in the relationship between, for example, developers that are collaborating with local labels for projects uh, and really healthy, you know, music hack days and stuff that 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 is that is very interesting for the industry as well. But but beforehand, the industry has, has been pretty slow to, to set up its own systems. So I guess that's why we also part of the problem. There's a couple issues here. I'll just talk about two. I, I think this is only a bit of it. You know, people always say, why didn't X industry do this itself? Why didn't the book business set up Amazon? Why didn't the music business set up iTunes? To an extent, there may be a failure there. But if you have six major book publishers, I'm talking about the US, and they all get in a room and plan something, you don't have an online company, you have an antitrust case. Right? So there is legal, you know, there's legal reasons why they can't cooperate in some cases. I mean, the, in the US, there was an antitrust case against five of the six publishers just for doing a deal with Apple. Imagine if Apple wasn't in the room and they did that deal themselves. You know, it, it's, it's, there's legal reasons, good reasons. Maybe they shouldn't apply here. Maybe there should be exemptions here. But the reasoning behind this is solid why you can't cooperate like that. The second reason is that all these industries were traditionally very insular. You know, the, the classic thing in the U.S. is that, you know, the dentist who makes a lot of money invests in a Hollywood movie, you know, he meets a lot of starlets, gets a hot new girlfriend, and he loses all his money. It's very hard to understand some of these businesses. I mean, I talk to journalists who are covering this for sort of more outside publications who are really smart, but you try to explain to them the difference between how ASCAP works and how SSM works, it takes a while to get that. These businesses were very complicated because of the way they developed. They're insular businesses. That insularity served them very well for a while until suddenly it did not. All of a sudden now you need to bring in ex expertise. If you want to experiment with pricing, it behooves you to hire a consultant who specializes in pricing. Not necessarily to take what they say as gospel, but to learn how do you run experiments and gather data. There are people who are experts at this. You need to bring some of that expertise in. We're seeing that happen more, and I think that's a good thing. The, comp the companies that come from outside and say, we're gonna redefine this business, don't tend to do well. The companies that do well are either companies from the outside that bring in insider expertise or companies on the inside that bring in yeah. outsider expertise. I don't think that's going to change because the media business has always been partly a gut business, and I don't think that will change. I don't think you can metric your way out of figuring out what's going to be a hit. Yeah. Sure. If I, and if I could, I'd be... Uh, I'd have written my teen vampire novel already. Exactly.
<laughs> and finally, I wanted to talk about uh, Washington, and we're, we're here, sort of, the, it's uh, the capital of lobbying, where lobbying has been invented, and, uh, and so uh, there are a lot of different groups that are working towards uh, lobbying for, for their own uh, sets of, uh, of interests, of course, uh, and then when you have uh, groups like Public Knowledge, for example, that have been uh, very successful in uh, advocating uh, against a project like SOPA, for example. And, and so what are your thoughts on, on Public Knowledge and uh, sort of the technology side of, uh, of uh, uh, pushing towards a m more open copyright uh, and, and, and instead the uh, industry bodies, like, for example, the ANMPA that does the lobbying for the publishers? Well, I don't want to talk about specific groups like Public Knowledge because that, that would be a much longer got to buy the book for that. No, I'm kidding. I, I yeah, think that would take a longer time. Right. And, and public knowledge is more, is more reasonable than some, and each one is different. But let me, one of the things I was surprised about when I wrote my proposal to sell the book, I was surprised that a lot of these groups that advocate for looser copyright, less protection for creators, get money from the technology business. Does that mean that they're bought and sold, they have no independence? I don't think so. Does that mean that they're influenced by the technology business? Yes, that's what we call a conflict of interest. Um, you know, and that has framed the issue as this is the world versus the media companies. But I think that's a simplistic way of looking at it. The job of a lobbyist, I'm quoting someone and I forget who, so with my apologies, the job of a lobbyist is to, con is to confuse the interests of a specific company with the public interest. Yeah. Everyone does that. If you talk to the MPA, they'll say that Hollywood is one of the most important businesses in America. I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying it's not, but that's your job to say that. You talk to Google, they'll say technology is the most important business in America. That's something I would take seriously. It's not a ridiculous comment, but they're saying that because they're paid to say it. So. I guess my viewpoint, which is pretty cynical, but that's a um, sort of professional hazard in what I do, is that you know you got to look at what people are saying and say, okay, why are they saying it? Follow the money. You know, when people talk about digital theft instead of copyright infringement, I think they make some good points. I don't like the word digital theft. I think it stops a conversation when we should be starting one. You know, when you say that copyright presents major, major problems with free speech, it does occasionally present problems, but no court has ever found that. Yeah. You know, do I want to shut down the internet so I can sell more books? No, not at all. It's been, you know, for someone people say hates the internet, you know, my, my wife says, you know, people say you hate the internet, you spend a lot of time online. I, I, I like what technology can do. Um, but, you know, it's important to realize that people who make these cases are not advocating the public interest. Do we have a public interest in the open internet in protecting copyrighted works? Y yes, of course, but we would be foolish to take what lobbyists say completely at face value. Sometimes they're right, but you gotta dig a little deeper. You know, I'll finish with one thing. Sure. It's become a tradition. Every time the MPAA funds a study that says copyright infringement is costing, you know, six gazillion dollars from the economy and the end is near because if you don't stop pirating, we're going to get hit by a meteor. It, people like to laugh at it. Oh, it's the MPA with another hysterical study. I, I question the six gazillion. I think copyright infringement is bad for the economy. Yeah. They're right in principle. Some of those numbers, I'm not sure quite where they come up with them. When the technology business funds a study, people take it at face value. Yeah. If one set of numbers that's been bought and paid for is suspect, both sets of numbers that have been bought and paid for should be suspect. You know, is Google right in spirit that fair use helps grow the economy? I think they have a good point. Do I trust their numbers more than the MPA's numbers? No. They both seem to hire the same kinds of academics who do the same kinds of, you know, somewhere in, in this country, I get the feeling there's like, you know, the such and such center for both statisticians, and they're all, they all sort of study. It's this bunch of tenured professors studying to do fake studies. It, it, it's my, my point is you have to apply equal skepticism. Yeah. And journalists, and this is where I get mad. You know, I was talking to a gentleman from Google last night. He said, "You know, do you resent Google for lobbying?" I said, "No. Google does a very good job aggressively advocating its own best interests." 
congratulations. Yeah. Every company has to do that. It's your responsibility. Journalists who are cynical about the copyright business are not cynical enough about the technology business. That's what, something that's important to me. Forget about it as a copyright holder. As someone who like lives in the world, you want to see people aggressively question stuff. At some point, journalists started taking things from one side at face value, and that's something that I think is really bad, whatever side of the debate you're on. Even if you disagree with everything that I say, it doesn't give you the right to take one side at face value, because that's definitely the wrong thing to do. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much for your time, and I think if you stuck around up until the end of the interview, I think you'd be absolutely interested in Free Ride uh, by Robert Levine, and uh, thanks so much for being on. Thank you very much. I also want to add the book is now also out in Spanish as Parasitos, which may, may make it, it sound slightly more exciting than it is, but it is available in Spanish. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.